wise and discerning. Dignified, scholarly, brilliant. Bold, compassionate, dedicated. Grounded, open, engaged. Eloquent, visionary, strong, thoughtful, and diplomatic. The Kluge Prize rewards thorough, accessible scholarship and strong public leadership. And Drew Gilpin Faust embodies all the traits we were seeking as a prize recipient. I see myself uh, fundamentally as a historian. I grew up in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia at a time when much was changing, but when history also was very present. It was in the 1950s and 60s. We lived in the midst of Civil War battlefields, but it was also the time of the emerging civil rights movement. Brown, Brown v. Board, of course, the effort to close public schools in Virginia through massive resistance, all of that was very much in the air when I was a small child. So I think the, the questions of past and present intersected for me very vividly as the American traditions of governance and race and justice and equality all played out before my eyes, but also were part of what I was hearing about the places in which I lived and their history. I think that uh, Drew Faust was an excellent choice for the 2018 Kluge Prize for the Study of Humanity because her life has been a study. She's a humanist and a historian. Her life has been the study of who we are and how we deal with uh, crises but then her life has also been as an exemplary leader uh, through the turbulent times that we all live in. And so she not only has researched and studied uh, this as a scholar for all of us, she's also exemplified uh, uh, leadership and, and humanity. And uh, I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful, a wonderful choice. Drew Faust is an historian. So she understands that it's not just science and technology. As important as they are, it's the values that are infused uh, into those technologies. And that's where her background helped to ensure that we were constantly lifting our gaze to the constellation of possibilities. She has been a historian of the American South, of American women, and of the American Civil War, and of the intellectual history of the South in particular, uh, as distinguished and as important as anyone in the past uh, 40 years. Um, her work will always stand uh, as some of the most important contributions to Civil War history, the history of the South, and the history of American women. You have made a real difference throughout your entire professional career, and I know that you will continue to do so, as you put it, uh, to help us build a more enlightened world. So congratulations and best wishes on your future endeavors. Drew, I want to congratulate you on your service as a historian and as an innovator in higher education. Thanks to you, both the general public and our leaders have a greater understanding of our shared history and the experiences that have shaped our nation. Dr. Hayden, members of Congress, mem members of the Diplomatic Corps, and members of the Library's James Madison Council, scholars and distinguished guests, I'm John Haskell, director of the Kluge Center. On behalf of the Library of Congress, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh conferral of the John W. Kluge Prize for the, stud for the Study of Humanity. Incidentally, this event is being recorded for placement on the Library's website and it is being live streamed, so I also welcome our viewers from around the world. The John W. Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity is unique among international awards. The prize covers a wide range of scholarly fields, virtually all of the humanities and social sciences and other areas. It honors scholars who over a sustained period have distilled wisdom from the cumulative record of human ex experience and have had a major impact on public life. The selection process is democratic and broad. The library solicits nominations from a wide range of national and international individuals and institutions and uses a rigorous selection process involving curators, specialists, and a distinguished panel of outside scholars and, of course, the Librarian of Congress. 
We are deeply grateful to, to, to the late John W. Kluge for his generosity in creating the endowment that funds this prize, as well as the wide-ranging research of the many visiting scholars at the Kluge Center here within the Thomas Jefferson Building. Now, here in this institutional symbol of the importance of knowledge to our democracy, we especially want to thank the Congress of the United States for creating and sustaining the library for over two centuries, beginning with Thomas Jefferson's amazing collection, which has grown to over 160 million items. The U.S. Congress has been the greatest single patron of a library in the history of the world. We thank the distinguished members who are in the audience and with us tonight. And now, I have the honor to introduce to you the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Thank you. I'm so honored and pleased to welcome all of the distinguished guests tonight, and thank you so much for being here with us on this very special evening. John has already told you a little bit about the history of the Kluge Prize, but before we go any further, I'd like to recognize one very special person in our audience. My predecessor, the 13th Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington. Dr. Billington had the vision to create this prize, as well as the Kluge Center, and he worked alongside the late John W. Kluge to turn this dream into reality. So we thank you, Dr. Billington, for your vision and for your many years of service and leadership to our nation. It is now my great pleasure and privilege to confer the seventh Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity on our Laureate. Drew Gilpin Faust stands among the most distinguished historians of our generation. Throughout her career, she has demonstrated clear vision and intellectual courage, spending countless hours in the archives and among primary sources, some right here at the Library of Congress, uncovering the vital research and threads of our country's social history. Her work has added to our understanding of the Civil War, the history of the South, and the history of women in the United States. By granting us a greater understanding of our heritage and some of the decisive ideas and conflicts that shaped it, her work continues to provide context to the many challenges we face in public life today. In addition to her skilled craft as a historian and educator, she has been a leader in the public sphere. In 2007, following her very successful tenure as Dean of the Radcliffe Institute, she took office as Harvard's 28th president. And for over a decade, at the helm of one of the world's most distinguished centers of higher research and learning, she guided the institution through a time of national financial crisis. And during her leadership, she expanded financial aid for undergraduates, working to make the Harvard community more diverse and accessible. And she ably promoted the university's mission in the arts, sciences, and humanities. She also led the, in the creation of innovative learning and interdisciplinary programs and strengthened the university's international impact. Dr. Drew Gilpin Faust, will you please come forward to receive the Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Faust. And now we will hear from our laureate.
Thank you to all of you for being here. I know how many things there are to do in this city and that you would choose to be here tonight means the world to me. And I wanna especially thank Carla Hayden for awarding me this prize and for taking on the Library of Congress. It's just about to be her second anniversary as librarian, September 14th. So I think we should have a round of applause and congratulations to her. Dr. Billington, Secretary Chow, so many distinguished guests and friends in this room. I am so grateful for this award. It's hard for me to find the words to convey that. And also to convey how humbled I feel to be in the pantheon of its recipients. I'm delighted to be awarded this recognition by the Library of Congress, an institution that has meant so much to me throughout my scholarly career. From the papers of 19th century South Carolina Congressman and Senator James Henry Hammond, a key figure in my first two books, to the diaries and letters of Clara Barton and the searing Matthew Brady photographs so central to my last, the library's collections have been essential to my explorations of the history of the American South and the nation's experience of civil war. That this award comes from the Library of Congress is a signal honor. That it is awarded for achievement in the study of humanity is a recognition I could scarcely have dreamed of. It affirms what I have seen as a vocation, a calling, a life purpose, both in my own dedication to such study but also in my efforts on behalf of the institutions, especially universities, that have enabled and encouraged this pursuit. The path I've chosen into the study of humanity has been history. From my earliest years, which I guess I discussed already a little bit on the video, growing up in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley in the 1950s and 60s, I felt the presence of the past all around me. I lived on a farm on the Lee Jackson Highway, amidst fields where Confederates and Yankees had skirmished. And I played Civil War with my brothers in the woods near our house. But I also knew, even as a young child, that my own era was a historic time in its own right one of controversy and challenge to the entrenched order of segregation that had replaced slavery after the Civil War. History seemed to surround me, even as a new history was being created before my eyes. The past of slavery, war, and racial injustice so present in my childhood would later become the focus of my scholarly work. But the questions I would ask of the 19th century had implications for my own world as well. I sought through research and writing to understand how human beings had come to create the slave society of the Old South and how slavery's oppressions had become for millions of white Southerners not just an accepted way of life, but what they justified as a positive good and what ultimately, in the hundreds of thousands, they died to defend. A century later, I had grown up amongst adults who supported segregation, a system that had seemed to me, even as a young child, at odds with the democratic and Christian values those same adults taught me to espouse. If I could understand the Southern past, perhaps I could better understand the Southern present. My PhD dissertation and my first book were about the pro-slavery argument. You might say I wanted to understand inhumanity how men and women throughout history have persuaded themselves to defend ideas, practices, societies, governments, 
that we of a different era see as indefensible. I wanted to know how humans can become blind to evil. Perhaps if we could understand their processes of denial and rationalization, we might gain insight into our own failures of vision, the shortcomings of our own time. History, in other words, can expand our awareness of ourselves. It releases us from the confines of our own individual lives. It offers us other ways of seeing that cast our assumptions into relief. It reminds us of choices people have made or not made, and thus it illuminates realms of possibility. It shows us that things have been otherwise, and it reminds us that things can be different once again. By documenting contingency and agency, history undermines any acceptance of crippling inevitability. And contingency means opportunity. It means we can change things and that what we do matters. To my mind, this is history's most important lesson. Although I had first focused my attention on the society and culture of the Old South, the implications of the questions I was exploring in my writing and teaching led me inexorably toward the Civil War. It seemed I had been steeped in that war from my earliest days. As I began my deeper scholarly explorations into its history, I soon came to understand Ernest Hemingway's observation to F. Scott Fitzgerald. War, he said, is the best subject. For me, it proved irresistible to study humanity when it is under maximum pressure when decisions and choices are literally matters of life and death, when the possibility for the best of humanity, courage, sacrifice, and the worst of humanity, cruelty, cruelty, brutality, when they collide. And I found myself drawn to explore with my students other wars as well, Vietnam, the two world wars, what was different and what unchanging about the human response to combat and conflagration. What was the product of time and circumstance? And what was the result of an essential and enduring humanity? How did the inhumanity of war compel its participants to reaffirm and reassert what humanity truly meant? And how did war extend beyond the battlefield to engulf the lives of civilians, of women, and of children? What, as we might put it, was the human face of war? It was in war's foregrounding of death that I encountered an unparalleled line of sight into the human condition and the subject for my most recent book, Mortality is a defining feature of humanity, and our recognition and anticipation of our inevitable end is a key element differentiating us from animals. All of life and all of philosophy, Montaigne once observed, is about learning to die. Yet we do so in different ways, in different eras, and different places. Facing the unprecedented slaughter of civil war, more than 2% of the population died in the course of the war, the equivalent of about 7 million people today. Americans confronted death in a manner both old and new. The widely shared Christian ideology of the good death provided lessons in how to die that shaped the response to unimaginable and unfathomable industrialized slaughter. The insistence of our forebears on adapting the rituals and practices that preserved their humanity, 
even in the face of catastrophe, seem to me an affirmation of the power and resilience of the human spirit. Even in almost impossible circumstances, soldiers and civilians alike struggle to bury, name, and honor the dead in ways that affirm the value of each human life. The national cemetery system that emerged from the war represents the expression of this impulse on a national level. For me, the research and writing for this book served as an excursion into the past with powerful resonance for a future that awaits us all. I have been deeply moved and gratified to learn that readers ranging from hospice workers to clergy to active and veteran military have found this book has spoken to them and to their experience. That is just a brief glimpse into what the study of humanity and inhumanity has meant for me and the kinds of questions that collections like the ones here at the Library of Congress have enabled me to ask. Other institutions have, of course, also supported this work, which would never have been accomplished without the rich intellectual environment of teaching and research nurtured by American higher education. Universities have served as the locus for humanistic inquiry from the time of their founding in the 11th century. Society has assigned primary responsibility for this stewardship to them. It has been the unique role of the university both to serve the immediate and urgent present and at the same time to look beyond it to pose larger questions of meaning, not just to propel us towards our goals, but to ask what those goals should be, to understand who we are, where we came from, and where we are going and why. Yet we find ourselves in a time when the value and legitimacy of these questions and of the fields that embody them are being criticized, weakened, marginalized. Increasingly, education is seen as instrumental. We expect it to, to provide a direct path to a specific job. We fail to ask how it will produce a thoughtful citizen or a person who can imagine beyond the moment in which we find ourselves to see and build the changing world ahead or how it can build a leader who can begin to address the profound impact of our extraordinary technological advances on our culture, our society, and our very understanding of what it is to be human. We see the results of this neglect all around us. We have invented the marvels of social media, but not figured out the ethics of the profound challenges it poses. We have made torrents of information <clears throat> available to almost everyone, but not equipped them with the skills of analysis and habits of discernment to separate truth from falsehood, or perhaps most alarmingly, to believe that this distinction matters. We are a society enthralled by the notion of innovation. But how can we imagine a new future without grasping how things were once different and can be different again? We are witnessing sharp declines in the fields designed to ask such questions and nurture such skills. I speak, of course, of the humanities and what are known as the qualitative, not mathematical, social sciences. Languages, literatures, history, philosophy, religion, anthropology, parts of sociology, and political science are at the core of this endeavor. And their departments, majors, jobs, and enrollments are plummeting. At Penn State, for example, the five years from 2010 to 2015 saw a 40% decline in humanities majors. At the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, 
there were 414 English majors in 2005 and 155 in 2015. Nationwide, numbers of history majors are down 45% since 2007. Since the 1990s, English majors have declined by half. The University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point announced it would abolish 13 departments, including French, German, Spanish, philosophy, and political science. One state governor <clears throat> listed the specific fields to be favored with state support, explicitly tying educational resources to job outcomes. He said, I want to spend our dollars giving people sciences, technology, engineering, math degrees, so that when they get out of school, they can get a job. He observed that his state did not need any more anthropologists. In fact, humanists do get jobs and over a lifetime earn only slightly less than their peers in the social and natural sciences. Jobs are, of course, important, but they are not enough to serve as the exclusive purpose of higher education. When we define the role of learning as solely to drive economic development, we risk losing sight of the broader and deeper questions of the kinds of inquiry that enable the critical insight, that build the humane perspective, that foster the restless skepticism and unbounded curiosity from which our profoundest understanding so often emerge. We shouldn't forget Einstein's words, not everything that counts can be counted, and that not everything that can be counted counts. It seems to me telling that one set of higher education institutions has not shared in this recent decline in the importance of the humanities. These are our military academies. Take the example of West Point. From its origins as an engineering school, the United States Military Academy has evolved over two centuries to be a very special sort of liberal arts college, one that recognizes that many of the most significant lessons it can impart for leadership must emerge from the study of humanity. The Academy describes it this way, the expansion of a person's capacity to know oneself and view the world through multiple lenses. The distinguished Academy graduate General George Patton, whose papers are here at the Library of Congress, insisted that a successful soldier must know history. To win battles, he observed, you do not beat weapons, you beat the soul of man. Alexander the Great slept with two things under his pillow, a dagger and a copy of Homer's Iliad to understand the human soul. No small aspiration, but one that has propelled my work for decades and the work of the humanities for millennia. In identifying what is distinctively human, we necessarily commit ourselves to its preservation and enhancement, to the appreciation of what unites us rather than the distraction of what divides us, to the advancement of the humane in a world that often seems bent on destroying it. We must support universities in their dedication to these efforts, and we must adopt a discourse that honors rather than disparaging these fields of inquiry. But to make this possible and sustainable within universities, we must also build broader understanding of the importance of the study of humanity outside and beyond them. And so let me return to where I began, to where we find ourselves tonight. In serving as the Library of Congress, this institution must also serve all the people that Congress represents, not, ju not just scholars, but the curious citizens of an entire nation. All of us are in this room because we are in some way 
connected to that work, because we are somehow invested in that endeavor. The extraordinary advances of science and technology that lie before us must be shaped by human and humane purposes if those values, and perhaps even humankind, are not to be destroyed. Let me invoke the historian's sense of contingency that I earlier described. It is up to us to define the nature and quality of human possibility. The contents of this library can help inspire us to inspire others to understand what those possibilities might be. Let me make this point by closing with a treasure from the library. I spoke earlier of the face of war. The Library of Congress possesses a remarkable collection of, I understand now, more than 3,500 Civil War faces that has been assembled and donated by Tom Lillianquist, who is here in the audience, and his three young sons. Inspired by newspaper photographs of U.S. service men and service women killed in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Lillianquists regard their collection of tintypes and ambrotypes as a memorial to the soldiers of the Civil War. This gives you a, a general portrait, but here is one of the ambrotypes from the collection. It's been tentatively identified as Sergeant Samuel Smith, his wife Molly, and daughters Mary and Maggie. The image was found in Cecil County, Maryland, so it's likely that this soldier was in one of seven regiments of United States colored troops raised in that state. Like all of the portraits in this collection, it speaks eloquently to us across the century and a half that separates us. For this soldier and his family, the message is one of pride, an affirmation of the new freedoms war had enabled him to claim. Slavery would have denied him the right to legally marry or to protect his wife and children from sale. This portrait is of a free man. It proclaims a new day for black families, a new respectability of fine clothing, and of daughters in matching coats and bonnets. And it portrays a soldier, an African American who under slavery would have been prohibited from bearing arms, and who until 1863 could not have enlisted in the army. Now he has joined what would be nearly 200,000 other black Americans to fight for freedom, to risk enslavement if captured, and to establish a claim to full citizenship and humanity as the Republic's bold defenders. In this photograph, Sergeant Smith, or whoever this might be, makes a statement about a new order of things. It is his own declaration of independence, his personal affirmation that all men, that he has been created equal, that he is fighting for a new birth of freedom. But these 3,500 portraits and thousands more like them are intended to send us another message as well one that speaks directly to the meaning of the study of humanity across time and space. These soldiers staring into the photographer's lens are self-consciously reaching through history. They are documenting their faces in their uniforms, partly because they know they may be killed in the battles ahead. But they also know they are making history in this war and they want to capture that for us. Attention must be paid, they are saying. Don't forget who we were and what we did. Let us give you the means to see us, to understand us long after we are gone. Our present 
is delivered to us at a price paid by those who came before. History helps us remember our accountability to them, as well as our obligations to more than just ourselves and more than just our own time. It is a way of knowing and valuing that has never mattered more. Thank you very much. Thank you for those inspiring words, Dr. Faust. And uh, all of us at the library look forward to working with you in the future. I know I can speak for all of us on that. And uh, I now invite everybody to um, make your way upstairs for dinner. Um, and uh, thank you again. <laughs>